What's really important is when you wake up in the morning and that you have enthusiasm and you're ready to go. And that's the state that I like to think of, that you've always got, you feel positive that there's a future ahead of you. And so that you're not physically constrained. I think those are, you know, certainly as you get older, the, the risk that you're going to get a chronic degenerative disease is so high and that becomes limiting. But then you've got the mental side that can be limiting. So it's really both, you must combine the two. You must be physically strong and largely disease free, but then you must also have the mental capacity to, to enjoy life and look forward to it and be enthusiastic. It, like health is something you only realize when it's gone. That's when you realize that, that gosh, I, I took it for, for granted. So I certainly don't take it for granted anymore that you wake up every morning and you feel ready to go and that everything's working perfectly. But that's the state that you're looking for. And I think the another is another point. As you get to my age, you start, you want to die perfectly. You have to have a perfect death. And you need to build up to that because I, th I mean, you know, my father's illness and that influenced me greatly. And I never wanted to put my own children or grandchildren through that. You know, I want to wake up dead one morning and that, that's the way to go. Uh, but it takes effort to get there. And, and if you do that, if you can delay your incapacitation for as long as possible until your last moment, that that's the ideal. It's the one where you literally you go to bed at night and you you don't wake up the next morning. That's that's the perfect death. And that you don't have a long debilitation. I think that's one of the keys, is this long descent that you get. And I'm, there's no doubt in my mind that that descent is driven by chronic disease, obviously. So you've got to stop the chronic diseases or you get them so that you don't have major symptoms and, and disability. Disability is the issue. I was very active at school, but sport and endurance exercise was never an issue. And then I very fortunately got into endurance sports for many years and was very active and very fit and very healthy. And uh, then unfortunately, that was the time of the high carbohydrate, promoting the high carbohydrate diet. And unfortunately, I turned out to have severe insulin resistance. And so that this eventually within a few years i could tell that there was something wrong but i didn't know what it was and i was just thought it was just aging and then ultimately after 33 years of promoting this high carbohydrate diet i eventually converted fortunately by reading the book by eric westman the new atkins for the new you and that was the life changer for me because i realized that that everything i'd been saying was wrong and I be, and I've very quickly realized as I changed my diet that all the symptoms I'd been developing over 20 years had suddenly disappeared. So I had this miraculous recovery, and then I discovered I had type 2 diabetes. And so then I understood what my problem was. Here I was trying to be very active, but profoundly insulin resistant, eating a high carbohydrate diet and suffering the consequences. And then when I took the carbs out, I became very healthy. And that's that's pretty much when we met. And since then, I, sh I, I see, I say I should be dead now. I'm talking to you from the grave. <laughs> because my father had his diabetes for 10 years and then was crippled by it and died. And I've had my diabetes, which is in remission, fortunately. I've had it for well over 10 years. And currently... You know, I don't have any overt symptoms that I'm aware of. So I'm not suggesting that I'm never going to get the symptoms or the the clinical picture of it, of type 2 diabetes, the complications. I'm not claiming that. But so far, I put it off for, for 12 to 14 years, which is, which is pretty miraculous, I, as I said. You know, I was very much there when your shift happened from this high carbohydrate, very much insurance athlete, carb loading. I mean, the lore of running and everything, you know, you promoted carb loading in the biggest yeah. way, right? And um, when that shift happened, and I will never forget how fierce that backlash was from the medical community in South Africa. I mean, with our conference, our CME or 
CBD points were revoked because of the dietitians saying that the information that Eric Westman, Gary Taubes, Jay Wartman, Steve Finney, you know, you, Rob Cyrus, Asima, Hotel Jason Fung was putting forward was going to kill people. And here we are 10 years later, right? And has it, I mean, I don't want to say has it killed anybody, but look how much has changed. Yeah, no, well, thanks to people like yourself who supported me that that made it a lot easier. And and of course, my family and and I think that and ultimately, I knew that we were right. So that yeah. didn't worry me. So but it was extremely tough. And for a long period, I had post-traumatic stress disorder. In other words, when I talked about the trial, I would get near, I'd get feel sick again and I'd get all those symptoms, which which was very unusual because otherwise I was fine. But I remember particularly giving one lecture to doctors, and that that was what was really difficult, was lecturing to doctors and <laughs> suspecting in the audience that there were many who were not taking, who still had the same feelings. But now we passed it, and we produced the textbook, which hopefully you'll draw attention to, <laughs> which was published about a it. month ago. Yes. Yeah. And that, to me, is an astonishing achievement because it shows that this diet, the ketogenic low carb diet is the most studied diet ever. And it's the most effective diet ever. And so anyone who says, you know, there's no evidence or whatever, will we put the evidence 500 pages of evidence. And when we submitted, there were 200, a quarter of a million uh, words of referencing so that the references in the loan with 250,000 words. So that's how much evidence. And, and what was so beautiful was that all the leaders in the field of low carbs donated their time, but they wrote their life history. They, this is what they've done. It's their life work, and it's captured there. And it, it's an astonishing book. Bob, that is <laughs> it should so be revolutionary. It will be revolutionary, no yeah. doubt. Okay, tell me some highlights from, from the book. Well, I think the main highlight is that we got all the best people in the world to write on every organ system in the body. Okay. So there was nothing that we left out. And you mentioned earlier that the neurological side, that's covered complete, the cardiovascular, the respiratory, the metabolic, it, the diabetes obviously is a big focus, but it's all there. So any specialist in any medical discipline has to read the book to get up to date on what nutritional advice he should be giving his he or she should be giving his patients with the all these variety of diseases and we found believe it or not now these are athletes they're not the world's greatest athletes but they middle aged up to say 40 from 25 to 40 they're all lean and they're all training and 10% of them sorry 30% 3 of the 10 were pre-diabetic on the high-carb diet. They had no clue. When they went on the high-fat diet, disappeared, completely normalized. So that proves to us that it's the carbs. It's not the lack of exercise, it's not the obesity, because all that changed in the trial was they cut the carb content. They didn't cut the calories, and they didn't do more exercise or, more, or lose weight. So the only thing that changed was their carb and probably you could say processed food intake. Yeah, And their diabetes completely disappeared. And we've also got a link to their metabolism because those who burnt the most fat, remember we said three grams per minute, they were the ones who had the best glucose control and benefited the most. So many of those were the ones who were pre-diabetic, who scored these very high fat oxidation rates. So there's something going on there as well. Okay. So there's where DOM fits in to okay. those studies. And we've so those are the studies that we're doing at the moment. And as I've said, we'll have some results by the end of the year. So the problem arises. So I told you the 1939. Yes. Three, three guys, Boye, Christensen, and Hansen. They're from they're from Stockholm. Okay. And Boye, Boye is the main he's the main researcher, but he's also the main subject. So he gets on the bicycle and pedals for as long as he can. Okay. 
And what can they measure? They can measure blood glucose. So they measure blood glucose and they can measure oxygen as well. So his glucose goes like this and then it drops and he becomes exhausted and he can't do anything. And they gave him some glucose. And of course, and within five minutes, he's starting to feel better. And in 20 minutes, he says, fine, I can go on forever. And he goes on forever, you see. So, so they show that as his blood glucose falls, he starts to feel tired and weak. And they reverse that, and he's fine. But they also showed another thing, which has been forgotten. They showed, they confirmed, or as best they could, that that glucose, all it was doing was raising the blood glucose. It wasn't being used by the muscles to any great extent. Any, It wasn't increasing muscle glucose use. And they do, and there it is. All it is, they said, okay, what happens? As you exercise, your glucose falls, and you must take the glucose, and then that... In the brain slowing you down because you can't you can't continue or you'll damage your brain. There's too little glucose for the brain, so it stops, and you reverse that. So they said it's a central brain mechanism that stops you. So 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 a year and a half ago, I look at my the slides I've been projecting for forty years, uh-huh. <laughs> and I notice in that original study from these Scandin- also Scandinavians, I notice a problem. That although they show your muscle glycogen goes down, at the same time, they show your blood glucose goes down. And so when you're exhausted, the blood glucose is extremely low. Uh And they said, oh, we can ignore the glucose. It's all muscle glycogen. But you can't do that because the whole theory up to that point was it's the blood glucose that's important. Yeah. So that's what made me start questioning what was happening was the blood glucose the real regulator or was it the muscle glycogen okay and that's why we started testing these different trials to see if you start exercise with low muscle glycogen can you perform well and we said yes you can so therefore the idea that you have to have muscle glycogen is false and so so that's the basic point at this point i we we will show it i hope in these trials that as long as you keep your glucose normal Carbohydrates are irrelevant. You can burn fat, you can burn fat or carbohydrates, doesn't matter. But you can't allow the glucose to fall because that's when you're in trouble. It doesn't, if you live on a high fat diet or you live on a high carbohydrate diet, your performance is going to be the same. Got it. It's okay. not going to be different. Okay. And that's what you obviously you that's have fine. to have the right nutrition. Okay. Which, you know, you can't be vitamin B12 or iron deficient. That's obviously so you obviously you need the optimum nutrition but i'm not sure we really fully understand what is optimal nutrition before it was you know have lots of vegetables and lots of carbohydrates and grains and that's not right well we have to get back as you know to eating the diet that for which humans are evolved and we've got to take out the sugar and the carbs from our children that's where the problem starts i mean as you know and that that's a great challenge and the the only solution really is that we've got to teach people that you're responsible for your own health and nutrition is number one and exercise is number two and sleep, etc. So I lived the life thinking exercise was number one and I proved that's not the case. But exercise is terribly, terribly important. But you can exercise all you like if you're on the wrong diet. You you're not gonna it's not gonna help. So the nutrition is so disturbed because of industrial influence on our nutrition. And then we have the medical profession who's completely controlled by the pharmaceutical industry and the food industry, as we exposed in my trial. Yeah. That's that we have to reverse that. And so people have to learn that. And then we have all these vaccines as well. And I mean, you come from your, you know all about that in your in the United States. And and people now think, well, you you to make children healthy, you vaccinate them. I mean, that's How and that's the worst. Unhealthy. Yeah, that's right. So it starts from the mother's pregnancy. She's got to eat properly, as you know. That that's the beginning, and then you've got to wean the child onto proper foods and get rid of all the junk, ultra processed foods. So it's a it's a massive challenge, and it. I don't know where it begins. I'm very hopeful Robert Kennedy wins the election, the presidential election. That is a question.
question I have for you. Okay. Because he's promised yeah. to change the nutrition and he looks fantastic. I, I, I'm so glad to be my age. I'm 74 in a few weeks. Oh, and wow. to, to look around and to see the people who haven't looked after their health at my age. And they have certain characteristics. They've lost all their muscle. They've got no more muscle. Sarcopenia. And they, they curve forward and they're in this position. And once you see that, I call that the dead man's curve. So you, you know, you've got, to, you've got to get rid of that dead man's curve. Mm -hmm. And so I do that with, with lots of gym work and CrossFit. Thank you. Sorry. Now I must tell you, of course. So, so <laughs> when you invited me to the CrossFit conference yeah. in Madison, Wisconsin, and you told me I had to go to the gym the next morning. And we went. And then and then I couldn't walk for a week. So and then when I came back to Cape Town, you put me in touch with Tyron. Yeah. And we have just had this amazing relationship and we've had such a good time that he's now training both my daughter Candace yes. and our granddaughter, Annabelle. 